recording is on. Hi, everyone. Hi, all the courageous uh, astro seismologists, uh, enthusiasts. <laughs> it's good to see you all. Good to see that you make it even at this uh, late hour of the day or early. Welcome to the Good Vibration Seminar number uh, nine, I believe. Hi everyone. So we can we are we're lucky to have people from the US with us. Even hi Ashley. Even uh, Masao from from Tokyo has made it with us today. It's 6 a.m. there, so we're very glad. Welcome everyone to the Good Vibration Seminar uh, number nine. So today our speaker is uh, Diego uh, Godoy Rivera. Um, just a couple of, 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 uh, of words be, be, before we start. Uh, so we have completed our first, se first season um, of uh, the Good Vibration Seminar series. Uh, we have all, our, all, all the speakers uh, we, 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 we wanted to have before summer. So, um, we have also a lot of uh, uh, talks which were recorded and uh, you can access it if it was on a different time zone than yours you can always access it uh, on the website okay i will just uh, put the the link uh, in the chat so that you can retrieve um, the youtube links if you if you wish um, so i will uh, very quickly let the uh, floor to Savita Mathieu, who accepted to introduce our speaker of the day. So thank you, Savita, and the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Rita. Um, so, well, I guess maybe Mark would have been a good person to introduce Diego as his, his PhD student. Um, but since I also proposed Diego, I guess I, I get to, to do this. Um, so today we have the pleasure of having uh, Diego Godoy Rivera. He's going to talk about the work he did during his PhD, but I will introduce a little bit uh, what he did. So he did his uh, undergrad uh, at the Universidad Católica in Chile, uh, working on white binaries and their application to gyrochronology. Uh, and then he did his PhD with uh, Mark Prinson at Ohio State University, working on uh, stellar rotation and stellar evolution. So his main in research interests are gyrochronology, as you can see. Uh, evolution of stellar rotation across the HR diagram using single stars, binary stars, and star clusters as empirical constraints. So I guess uh, Diego is going to talk about um, his two uh, latest papers. Uh, so uh, yeah, we're very excited to have you here, Diego. So the floor is, is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Savita, for that introduction. Um, and thank you to the committee for the opportunity to give this talk. I am very, very excited. Um, can you see my screens and hear me just fine? Uh, yes, it's yes. perfect. Okay, okay great. Um, yeah, okay. So my talk is on, uh, oh, the title of my talk is uh, Stellar Rotation um, in the Gaia Era, Revised Cluster Sequences and Prospects for the Post-Main Sequence. So stellar rotation is one of the most important properties of stars uh, together with mass and metallicity. And uh, rotation has some very interesting dependencies on mass and metallicity. And so I'm going to start uh, with this very uh, historical figure from Kraft 1967, which shows uh, rotation as a function of mass. So we have on the y-axis projected rotational velocity as a function of stellar mass on the x-axis. It's actually log of the mass, so the sun is down here um, in the bottom right. And so we see that basically high mass stars rotate rapidly and low mass stars rotate more slowly. Um, but we understand this from the point of view of stellar structure. So this green line is roughly 1.5, 1.4 solar masses. So stars to the left of this line um, have convective pores and relative envelopes and stars on the right of this green line have uh, radiative pores and convective envelopes and the lowest mass stars are even uh, fully convective. And so the stars on the right of this green line, um, they have a 
dynamo, which means that their, their uh, rotation is connected to their, their convection, their activity, and their stellar winds. And so they lose angular momentum via magnetized winds and they spin down with time. Whereas the stars on the left uh, of this green line, they don't spin down. Um, and one of the more most interesting uh, things about rotation is how it changes as a function of time. So this figure here shows, uh, this is uh, adapted from Skumanich uh, almost exactly 50 years ago, 49 years ago, uh, and shows rotational velocity on the y-axis as a function of age um, on the x-axis. And so Skumanich uh, did this plot for stars like the sun um, with one young cluster, one intermediate age cluster and the sun here. Uh, and he discovered that rotational velocities decrease roughly as one over the square root of the age. Um, we can compare this onto a rotation period uh, and we get that the rotation period increases roughly as the square root uh, of the age. And so this opens a very interesting window in which um, if we can calibrate the relation between rotation and age well enough, we can use rotation as a chronometer. Uh, the idea being that if we can measure a rotation rate here, we can then map this onto an age and this idea is known as uh, gyrochronology. So that's one of the reasons why you should care about uh, ro rotation, uh, which is because there's a wide need across all of astrophysics pretty much uh, for an accurate age uh, diagnostic. And so two of the uh, uh, research areas that would greatly benefit from having an, uh, an accurate age diagnostic are exoplanets and uh, galactic evolution. Uh, so exoplanets, as illustrated here on the top right, we have discovered thousands of exoplanets that show a wide variety of architectures and configurations, uh, but really understand the, the, the planet uh, formation and evolution process and how they get to be in the configurations that we see them today, we need an accurate age diagnostic for their whole stars. Um, and here on the bottom, I'm illustrating that basically to really understand ga uh, galactic evolution, uh, how the galaxy got assembled, um, both from a dynamical point of view and from a chemical evolution point of view, we need an accurate age diagnostic. And we don't have that right now um, for most stars. And so the point here is that stars spend most of their lifetime on the main sequence. And so here I have an HR diagram. So luminosity versus temperature. I'm showing three different uh, parsec models um, at ages of three, five, and 10 giga years. And here I am separating the models in the different phases. So main sequence down here, subgiant branch here, and red giant branch uh, up here. And so the point is that we can use the, the technique of isochrome feeding to infer ages for evolved stars and for populations of stars. But if we look at the main sequence, this is not a sensitive diagnostic because populations of very, or stars of very different ages by factors of two or three are basically on the same place on the HR diagram. So we need an accurate age diagnostic here, and that's where uh, ro ro uh, rotation comes in. Um, but to really use gyrochronology, we need probes of rotation. And to do that, we need for independent estimates of rotation and age. And here, notice the importance of the, work, uh, of the word uh, independent. And so how do we estimate ages? Uh, as I ex just explained, one way to do this is doing isochrome feeding, which works for evolved stars or for populations of stars. The other way, as many of you know, is use doing uh, asteroid seismology, which kind of lets us see inside the stars. Um, how do we measure rotation on the other hand? The three main ways are using a light curve or a spectrum or a seismology again. So from a light curve point of view, let's say you have your favorite star, you wanna measure the rotation period, uh, the, stars, the star is probably going to have spots on the surface. Um, and as the star rotates, um, basically the, the spots are going to come into and out of your line of sight. So if you observe your star for a long enough time um, and with high enough precision, uh, you're going to see the signal from the spots in the light curve. And from that, we can infer a rotation period. Um, the other way is using um, a spectrum. So here I have two stars with almost the exact same uh, spectral type, but one of them is rotating slowly in the bottom and one of them rotating uh, rapidly on the top. So the idea is that more rapidly rotating stars have broader spectral lines. So that's another way to measure rotation. And finally, using asteroid seismology, um, we can infer rotations as well as inclination from the, from the splitting of the, of the modes uh, from, from a power spectrum. Um, and so all of this takes us to this figure, which is trying to summarize the current framework of stellar rotation. So there's a lot going on in this figure, so I'm going to... Uh, break it down. 
So this is adapted from Gallard and Bouvier 2015, and this is showing rotation rate on the y-axis normalized to the value of the sun as a function of age. Um, this is for stars with masses about 0.8 solar masses. Um, and we have both data and models here. So data are the open diamonds and models are the solid lines. And these are different uh, clusters. Um, so clusters are population that are all at the same age. Um, all the members of the cluster share the same age. And I'm gonna get into details of this in just a minute. Uh, but the point here is that we have clusters at different ages and within each cluster, we're calculating percentiles of rotation. And so rapid rotators are shown in blue, intermediate rotators in uh, green and slow rotators in red. Um, and here the models are, so, are sort of the, the best fit models that we have to re reproduce the, these empirical constraints. Um, and another reason why you should care about uh, rotation is that we can learn a lot about stellar physics from this. And so to point out a few things here, in point number one, we see that stars, when they're very young, they show a distribution of rotation rates uh, at birth, which is connected to the star formation process. Uh, point number two is that when stars are young, they have disks around them. Um, and the longer they keep their disks around, the, the more slowly they're going to rotate afterwards. So we can learn about the, the lifetimes uh, of these disks. Point number three is that some stars, uh, they decouple their envelope from the cores. That's why we get this kind of uh, funny shape here. Um, so we can learn about that also in point number three. Point number four is that after all of this has happened um, and the stars are kind of uh, settled on the main sequence, um, we see them spin down via, uh, because they lose angular momentum via magnetized winds. And so we can learn about winds in point number four. And point number five is kind of actually not really on the plot, um, which is what happens after the main sequence. Because, I mean, I, I guess it's not really on the plot because we sometimes don't really think about this as being kind of the same uh, underlying problem that we want to solve. Um, and so we, by studying point number five, we can start, uh, learn about angular momentum transport in the post-main sequence. Um, and so there are a few kind of um, questions that we can ask in this uh, diagram. So here in blue, I am highlighting some of the kind of the outliers in the data compared to the models. So we can ask the question, are these bad data or does our theory need revisions? And here uh, indicated in the green circle, we have uh, the question of what happens after the main sequence. And so all of these amounts to a need for novel and revised empirical calibrator. And this is what my work has done. Uh, so for the first part is going to focus on young main sequence stars, uh, stars in open clusters. And um, point number two is uh, post main sequence stars, particularly uh, subjects. So now going to the first part of, of uh, my talk. Um, oh, and this is going to summarize the work from, of my recent paper with Mark Pinsonal and Luis Arrebull. Um, the goal here is to study star clusters. So uh, star clusters are populations of stars that share the same age and the same chemical composition. And therefore by studying clusters of different ages, we, um, they, they are going to provide snapshots of the evolution of, of, of stars. Um, and all throughout this, this talk, I'm gonna be showing you different versions of this diagram that I call a rotational sequence, which has rotation period on the y-axis, uh, slow rotators in the top, rapid rotators in the bottom, uh, and it's going to have either mass or temperature or color on the x-axis, uh, but the idea is that high mass stars are going to be on the left, low mass stars on the right. And so by filling this diagram for any given cluster, we're going to map the dependence of rotation with mass. This is one of such examples for the open cluster uh, M50, about 150 mega years old by Irwin et al. 2009. And so we see a lot of structure here. You know, we see kind of a, a slowly rotating branch up here. We see the M dwarfs rotating very rapidly. Um, but the point here is that uh, if you look at the year of this paper, you know, this came out a long time ago. And uh, basically people didn't have good membership information for the clusters that they were observing to, uh, to learn about stellar uh, rotation. And so we can ask the question, you know, um, are these, are these outliers up here real data? What about these guys? What about this very rapid rotator down here? Because we expect contamination from the field to be significant. Um, and so more generally, we can ask the question, what parts of this diagram are actually real um, when, once we remove the non-member contamination? And so that's the goal of this project, to take clusters for which we have rotational data 
um, identify them in astrometric phase space, remove the non-member contamination, and in that way provide a clean portrait of the evolution of rotation. And so this is a sample of clusters that we studied. Uh, we have seven clusters with ages uh, going from 35 mega years to 950 mega years. Um, the third column here shows um, the number of stars that have measured rotation periods um, that people thought were cluster members. Not necessarily all of these are real members, uh, but we're gonna get to that in just a minute. Um, and the point here is that we have, uh, these clusters were, were observed both from the ground and from space. Um, and so I'm going to come back to the importance of this uh, close to the end of this. Um, and to illustrate my method, I'm going to use one cluster as an example, NGC 2547. Um, of course, the Gaia data has been super important for this, particularly for this work. I use the Gaia DR2 data, which provides the 5D, sometimes six uh, dimensional information. So we want 3D position and velocities. Gaia provides this in the way of uh, positions in the sky, parallaxes, proper motions, and rail velocities, as well as uniform old sky um, photometry, which is also super helpful. <clears throat> and so I am now going to illustrate the method that we use. So again, the goal is to separate the cluster uh, and the field in, in astrometric phase space. And we want to do this in a blind way. So we want to identify first all of the cluster members and then pull out the stars that have uh, rotational measurements. And so these figures here show the different projections of the uh, parallax and proper motion phase space and proper motion versus proper motion here uh, on the right. And by matching the parallaxes and the proper motions of the stars, um, we identify three populations. So we have in blue the probable cluster members, uh, which look kind of just like a cluster um, in this projection, uh, kind of like a tight structure that has a large parallax, so a small distance, so it's a nearby uh, system. We have in red the non-members, or just the field, uh, which has small parallax, large distance, is a background uh, population. And in cyan, we have what we call the possible members. So these are, these are an intermediate population of stars for which the Gaia data really, for these stars, wasn't good enough for us to make a definite classification. Um, they are more likely, most of them, field stars or uh, non-members but they have such large error bars that some of them could actually be probable cluster members and they're just uh, scattering outside of, of uh, the cluster. Um, and so to kind of check on our method, um, we can look at the color magnitude diagram projections of this. So this is showing the Gaia uh, apparent color magnitude di diagram of the three populations. So, you know, if the stars that we're calling probable cluster members were real cluster members, uh, they should have the same age. You would expect them to look like an isopron on the, on the CMD. And that's exactly what they look like uh, here. Um, there is some funny business going on down here. I can get into the details of this in the questions uh, if, if you want. Um, so feel free to ask then. Um, and in red, we have the non-members, um, which are, you know, they look just like you would expect the field to look like. So we have the main sequence here, the giant branch here. And this is interesting for the possible members, again, shown in cyan, where we see that most of these correspond to very faint stars, kind of close to the limit where Gaia uh, has uh, data on. And so they are faint stars, large error bars, and that's why we can't really classify them. Uh, and the cool part about this is that notice that we did not use the photometry in our selection. This is just a consequence of our very careful astrometric uh, analysis. So if you, if you wanna ask questions about, I didn't have time to get into the details of the method of the astrometric selection, uh, but if you have wanna ask questions in the end, uh, I'll be uh, happy to, to answer that. Um, and the advantage of, do, of doing this in a blind way is that we can then feed an isochron to the cluster to the further cluster age. Um, and also by comparing with star models, we can map absolute magnitudes onto masses and temperatures. And so in this way, since we have the same data for all of the clusters, we can calculate masses and temperatures for the cluster members and ages for the clusters themselves, everything in a uniform scale. Uh, that was not possible before Gaia. And so now we'll get into the results of this. Again, the goal was to remove the non-member contamination from the rotational sequences. Uh, so this figure here shows rotation period on the y-axis as a function of temperature on the x-axis. On the left, I have the literature sequence. So all the stars for which people were able to measure rotation periods 
Um, but I am now color coding them by my membership classification. And again, this is NGC 2547, a 35 mega year old cluster. Um, so the probable members are shown in blue, the non-members, the contamination are shown in red, and the possible members are shown in cyan. And on the right, I have the same figure, but uh, now I am removing the non-member contamination. Uh, so this is the revised sequence. And so a few takeaway points uh, from this cluster, uh, we get a contamination rate of about 25%. So one in every four stars here was uh, a red uh, star, a contamination. And remember that people were using this cluster to learn about rotation in my introductory figure uh, from uh, Gallet and Bouvier. Um, we found that our analysis here as highlighted in these red circles, um, preferentially removed many of these slow rotators with periods close to 10 days or even longer. Not all of them though, uh, a, few of there are a few of them are still here, but, but uh, many of them. And if we now look at the revised sequence, we see some strong mass dependent uh, rotation period trends. Um, and so given the young age of this cluster, this tells us clues about the initial conditions of rotation. This is now the same figure for another cluster, M50, uh, the, that I, I also showed in my introduction. Uh, for this cluster, uh, you know, there are red points all over the place. We found a contamination rate of about 35%. Uh, um, and as you can see, as I, the points that I highlighted in my introduction, these very slow rotators up here, and these very rapid rotators down here turn out to be non-members. They were contamination. Um, and if we now look at the revised sequence here on the right, we see that the sequence shows a much uh, sharper pattern. You know, we see the slow rotating branch, a few stars on this rapidly rotating branch. Um, and unfortunately down here, the Gaia DR2 data wasn't good enough for us to perform the analysis. So this figure now shows the revised rotational sequences for all of the clusters. So rotation period on the y-axis versus mass on the x-axis and they are sorted by age. So they are getting older towards the, the bottom. And so the point is that here, I am showing the probable cluster members, the possible members, but I am not showing the stars that we classified as, as, as non-members. So we have removed the contamination. So this is our updated portrait of rotation evolution. Um, even though our analysis was blind to rotation, uh, we found that it predominantly removed many rotation or mostly removed rotational outliers. Um, as I showed before in, in M50 with the very slow rotators and some of the very rapid uh, rotators. Um, nevertheless, some outliers still remain and they are more easily seen here in the sequences of the, of the other clusters, you know, um, we can no longer attribute them to being contamination, these points, these outliers. Uh, they are real cluster members. I suspect most of them are binaries, uh, but nevertheless, they are cluster members. Um, at young ages here uh, and low masses, we confirm that virtually all of the M-dwarfs are born very rapidly rotating with periods less than about uh, two days. Um, and finally, um, you know, a fraction of our sample was observed from space, a fraction of our sample was, was observed from the ground. But I think unless you're an expert on the rotational data sets, maybe you wouldn't be able to tell from this, from this diagram which clusters were observed from the ground and which from space. And so the point here is that if we are careful enough about the membership contamination, um, basically we can study angular momentum evolution both from the ground and from space, uh, uh, at least in the context of uh, open clusters. <clears throat> Another way to look at this is to now collapse each of these sequences to just one line. So this is showing median rotation period as a function of mass in uh, beams of mass. So each uh, cluster now is just one line. Uh, we have the names and the colors here and uh, their ages. And so I'm gonna point out a few things uh, from this plot. First, uh, in this box here, uh, masses between one and 0.6 solar masses, we see that stars um, inhabit a global maximum in terms of median rotation periods. And so given the intimate connection between rotation and activity, uh, which uh, says that you know, more rapidly rotating stars are more active, they put out more, more high energy radiation, um, this could provide an optimal window for habitability. So that's one point. Another point is that, again, if we look at NGC 2547 here in red at 35 mega years, we see strongly mass dependent initial conditions. Um, whereas many simulations sometimes assume that their initial rotation rates are flat, are independent of mass, that can no longer be assumed. 
Um, if we now focus on, on, on the stars with masses less than about half a solar mass, um, you know, in particular, if we look at the Pleiades uh, in orange at 125 mega years and uh, Presepi in blue at 700 mega years, we see a very uh, strongly mass dependent spin down. You know, 0.2 solar mass stars have spun down by a factor of, you know, two. 0.5 solar mass stars have spun down by a factor of five or more. Um, now looking at higher mass stars, um, we see a consistent spin down. For instance, if we go from the Pleiades in orange at 125 mega years to M37 in green at 500 mega years to uh, Presepi in blue at 700 mega years. And, uh, and that's kind of the schumannic uh, behavior. But then when we get to the oldest cluster in our sample, NGC 6811 at an age of 950 mega years here in uh, purple, we see that the sequences are no longer sort of translations of each other towards uh, slower periods, but rather they seem to be overlapping here. We get some overlapping here. And so we were not the first one to find this, uh, but it is cool that we recover it in our data. Um, and that's very much, I think, an open, an open question still. Uh, there are a few ideas on how to explain this, um, but more work uh, needs to be done. And finally, we can look at this in the following way. So here I have four clusters uh, from our sample. They are sorted by age, getting older towards the bottom. Um, and I'm showing a rotation period as a function of mass. And, and sort of as a function of mass, I am separating the data in different percentiles of ro uh, rotation. So slow rotators are shown in the dark gray, intermediate rotators in black, and rapid rotators in the light gray. And so if we now look at the high mass stars, we see that you know, the sequences basically get narrower and narrower as we go to older and older ages. And you know, this result isn't new, but the new part is that the sequences are even narrower now that we have removed a lot of the rotational outliers, even though our analysis was blind to rotation. Um, and and uh, on the low mass end here, uh, with about 0.6 solar mass stars in the red boxes and about 0.4 solar mass stars, in the purple boxes, we see that if we go from the Pleiades to M37 and from the Pleiades to uh, recipe here, uh, and if we look at the black region, the interqualite range, we see that it gets wider uh, towards older ages. And this is interesting because traditional models would tell you that this range should basically remain the same. Um, and so one interpretation of this is that the more rapid rotators are being sort of left behind because they're experiencing a lower torque. And there are a few ideas on, on you know, what could produce a lower torque at this, as, uh, this paper by uh, Cecilia Garrafo argues that this is related to the, could be related to the magnetic uh, topology, uh, basically, um, of, the, of the magnetic fields. Um, and so just to finish this part of the talk, uh, you know, once the non-member contaminants are removed, the ground-based observations can be as constraining as the space-based observations. Um, our analysis was blind to rotation, but it preferentially removed rotational outliers. Many of them are still there though. Um, sort of like stars leaving a global maximum of median rotation at old ages, in the saturated domain, the interqualite range gets wider for older clusters uh, in contradiction with traditional models, uh, but a detailed comparison with models is still uh, pending. And finally, the initial conditions of rotation can no longer be assumed to be mass uh, independent. So we'll now transition to the second part of my talk, uh, where I will focus on post-main sequence stars, particularly subgiants. And so going back to my introductory slide, now we care about this green region down here. And this is going to uh, summarize my work uh, with uh, Jamie Tyre, Mark Pinsonal, and others. And so <clears throat> the subgiant branch is an intermediate stage of evolution. So here we have an HR diagram. The main sequence is the black line. And basically the subgiant branch is here. So it's something that happens between the main sequence and the red giant branch. Um, but kind of if we look in more detail, what's happening is that the stars um, are, they stop fusing hydrogen in the core. They are left with an uh, inert helium core and they fuse hydrogen in a shell around that core. But at the same time, the stars are going through structural changes such that the core contracts and the envelope expands. And so we have this very interesting question of what happens to the angular, angular momentum uh, transport and what happens to the coupling between the regions of the, of the, of the stars. Um, and we also have this open question of 
do we also have sort of a common dynamo mechanism uh, across the HR diagram? Do these subgiant stars have a rotation activity uh, connection as, as uh, dwarf stars do? Um, and so to answer this question, we need to very precisely characterize subgiant stars. And so with this in mind, I am part of a collaboration uh, that's led by Jamie Tyre, um, in which we're studying a sample of about 350 subgiant stars that were selected to be in the test continuous period zones. So they're uh, in this red region where tests, tests observed for, for, for a full year. Um, and they were selected to have probabilities of seismic uh, detections greater than 50%. And so again, the ultimate goal of this is to use subgiants for angular momentum evolution studies by combining a classical analysis that will tell us where they are on the HR diagram with an astro-seismic analysis that will let us see sort of inside the stars uh, and tell us about their core uh, rotation rates. And so my work has been sort of the first step in this, uh, in this process. Uh, so that's what I'll talk about now, about the classical analysis. And then if I have time in the end, I'll, I'll show you some uh, preliminary results from the, from, the, from, from the test data. Um, and so the first step, of course, is to uh, characterize our stars. So this is showing our stars on the Gaia absolute color magnitude diagram. I have models at 1, 5, and 13 giga years. These are uh, missed models for reference. And our data are shown as the color points. So the stars located in the northern test CVC are shown in red, and those in the southern CVC are shown in blue. Um, so you can see that they are, you know, the stars are near the subgiant branch. Uh, many of them are right on the subgiant branch. A few scatter up to the, to the RGB, a few scatter down to the main sequence, uh, but they're mostly on or near the subgiant branch. Um, and of course, this has observed uh, properties on the axis. We want real physical uh, properties. So to do that, um, I've, I perform a very detailed uh, characterization using photometry from Gaia, Tumas and Weiss, uh, parallaxes from Gaia, and we have a spectroscopy from Apogee for 50% uh, of, of uh, our sample. And so the method to do this that, that we use is uh, spectral energy distribution or SED fitting, uh, where we uh, plot the flux of the star as a function of wavelength. Um, we combine this with a parallax and we can uh, uh, estimate temperatures, radius, and luminosity. Um, and the software that we use for this is the ExoFast version two software, which is originally designed for planets, but turns out it works pretty well for stars. Um, and so ExoFast combines the ACD fitting with, uh, the, with um, isochron fitting. And so we can also derive ages, masses, and surface gravities, all kind of in a homogeneous way. And so these are the properties that we derive. Um, and this lets us place our stars on the HR diagram as shown here. So now it looks pretty similar to the CMD, but now we have real physical uh, properties on the axis. Um, and we do a very careful job and we derive mean, the, uh, we derive these quantities with mean random errors of 5% in uh, luminosity, 35 Kelvin in temperature and 2% in radius. And so I'm gonna show you a, a, a couple of interesting results from this work. Um, this is showing the same HR diagram that I showed you in the previous slide, but now color coding the stars by their fractional age uncertainty. And so here the ages only come from isochron fitting. There is no uh, seismology here. And so the most precise ages uh, are shown as the dark blue points. And so the point is that the most precise, precise ages, as well as uh, masses, are obtained in the middle of the subgiant branch, uh, which is the place where the models are the most separated from each other. Um, and as we stray further towards the RGB or the main sequence, we see that the age uh, precision drops. Uh, and this is interesting because we have the right masses and ages from a pure classical characterization. And then once we do the seismic analysis, we can compare both sets of values. Um, Another, again, as I, as I, as I uh, pointed out a minute ago, another interesting thing about studying subgiants is that we want to answer the question if, do they show a rotation, a rotation activity uh, connection? And so a fraction of our sample has apogee data. Uh, so for that, we have um, projected rotational velocities or V sine i's. And as a proxy for activity, uh, we're using this near UV excess uh, quantity. So for this, I gather near UV data from Galax uh, and I calculated the near UV axis, which is basically um, an estimate of how much uh, flux does the star have in the UV 
um, compared to what you would expect from a sort of normal stellar uh, population. And so the idea is that the more negative the, the near UV axis uh, means uh, the star is more active. And so that's why the, the, the axis here is uh, flipped. And so this is what our data looks like as the, the black points. Um, and we do the simplest thing that we can do, which is to just fit a line here shown as the cyan line. Um, and we derive these correlation coefficients uh, and their statistical significance shown here in the, the bottom. Um, so it's not a super strong uh, correlation. It's also not super obvious, but you know, it is uh, statistically significant to some degree. Um, and so we say that this is a uh, tentative correlation that provides supporting evidence for the rotation activity connection uh, in the post-main sequence. Um, I don't have the time to go into um, other works that have found similar correlations, uh, but, but feel free to ask about that in, in the end if, if you're interested. Um, and so to bring this part to a close, the conclusion from this is that uh, we have performed a very uniform and detailed characterization uh, for subgiant stars, uh, which can be used, so our, sam our sample can be used as a ca calibration set or as a training set for other studies. Um, we have demonstrated that subgiants are ideal for a highly precise classical characterization such that we can obtain masses and ages based on pure isochron feeding. And it will be interesting to compare these values with the seismic values that we're going to uh, um, obtain. Um, and finally, we have provided supporting evidence for the rotation activity connection in the post-main sequence. And so kind of as a global conclusion from the talk, um, we have done a ton of work, but the existing, existing portrait of stellar ro rotation remains partially incomplete, uh, in particularly the reliability of gyrochronology as a widely used diagnostic still needs to be validated in underexplored domains. Um, and this is a very interesting point, which is that the synergies between rotation and seismology are fundamental to prove the regime of old ages. Uh, and so, I mean, this. Citing here a couple of works that have done a ton of work on, on the kind of on the old age uh, regime to study uh, stellar rotation. Um, kind of in terms of future work for the open cluster work, um, as I showed before for M50 down here for lower masses, um, we couldn't really perform the full, the full analysis because the DR2 data, the Gaia DR2 data wasn't good enough. And so for this, I'm looking forward to using the EDR3 or DR3 or DR4 data uh, for this cluster and for all of the other clusters to really provide uh, the most comprehensive portrait that we can and to fully exploit the vast rotational data sets that we have available from clusters and also from uh, associations. Um, on the subgiants part, um, it will be interesting to explore the rotational activity connection using other activity indicators such as um, coronal X-ray emission or chromospheric emission, as well as with other um, rotation uh, indicators such as uh, surface rotation rates measured from tests. Um, and again, the ultimate goal with this sample is, is to provide unprecedented constraints for angular momentum transport uh, in the post-main sequence. Um, I'm, no, I'm, I'm close to running out of time, but if I can take two more minutes, um, I'm gonna show you some preliminary results from the, from the test work. So this is work being led uh, by Jamie Tyre, uh, who uh, kindly provided me with the, the plots that I'm gonna show you next. Um, and so these plots have rotation period on the y-axis, but note that it is flipped compared to my plot. And so uh, rapid rotators are in the top, slow rotators in the bottom. And we have uh, surface gravity on the x-axis, such as stars evolve from the main sequence on the left to the red giant branch uh, on the right. And so, here I'm showing uh, data for stars for which we have measured uh, su surface ro ro rotation rates and that have uh, masses from asteroseismology. And here the rotation rates come from the, all the uh, techniques that I introduced before. Um, here the solid lines are models for the evolution of the uh, envelopes of stars that include the truncated breaking uh, from the Gem Van Sater's 2016 result. So the takeaway from this is that the envelopes expand uh, and slow down in a mass dependent way. Now these points here show the constraints that we have for the cores of giants uh, from Kepler. They're also color coded by mass, but we see that you know we have this gap here in between where subgiants are. And so this is the, the window where, where we want to, you know, where our sample of subgiants 
um, can provide new constraints. And so these are the preliminary results for the core rotation rates of, of these stars. Uh, again, they are color coded by mass. Um, and so the, the kind of the main uh, takeaway from this is that, you know, we see the cores contracting these, um, and spin up, but not really in a strong uh, mass dependent way, which is interesting because these stars really are kind of spanning the, both sides of the, the, the uh, rough break. Um, and so uh, one quick sort of idea to how to or try to explain this is, you know, if we take the model here for a 1.2 solar mass star, um, and we sort of asked the question, what is the maximum amount of differential rotation that, 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 that you can uh, impose? Um, you know, if we follow a relation where uh, rotation rate is proportional to one over radius squared, we would derive these uh, profiles for the surface here in the solid line and the core of stars uh, as the dotted line. And so the point here is that even doing this sort of maximal differential uh, rotation, um, you can get the core to be that fast. Um, and so the takeaway point is that the observed core envelope contrast cannot be achieved by envelope differential ro ro uh, ro rotation alone. Um, and so this is some of the preliminary work that I wanted to show. Again, this is a work being led uh, by uh, Jamie Tyre. Um, I think I will, I will finish with that. I'll say thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Diego. Um, I guess I'm, uh, I'm going to applaud for all, all of the people who are around here. <laughs> um, that was a very interesting talk, uh, great. Um, one thing that I realized that I forgot to mention when I introduced uh, Diego is that last week he's, he defended his PhD. So <laughs> another round of applause for, for this. <laughs> yep, yep, two, two, two talks in less than a week, yep. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so uh, I guess we can we can take uh, questions now. So if you have any questions, you can raise your hand or also type the questions uh, in the chat. Uh, I don't know if anyone is raising their hands. I don't see anyone for the moment. Uh, well, maybe in the meantime, I, I will ask you. Um, uh, I thought it was quite interesting. If you can go back to uh, one of your latest plot with the NUV and the V sin i. Yep. Give me one second here. Uh, yep. Um, so one of the things I was wondering, I mean, the 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 inclination angle is uh, having quite some impact, right? So maybe it's not so uh, disturbing that the, we don't see any clear correlation. So having a plot like with the real rotation period would be maybe stronger, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's definitely a good point. Um, we don't know what the inclination is. Um, maybe we will, you know, if we eventually have four rotation rates for all of them and we get inclination from that, from that, that, that way we can, we can sort of fix this problem. Um, another thing that we wanted to explore with this plot was actually having I guess, um, a Rossby number on the x-axis, um, not just uh, ro rotation. Um, but to get a Rossby number, you need a convective origin uh, time scale. And doing that for subgiants, it's it's not not super easy. Uh, so that's kind of where we drew the line here. So yeah, there is more work to be done with, with, with this plot. Yep. Well, maybe with uh, having seismology for some of these stars, then you can have the depth of the convection zone and and then compute uh, more precise uh, convective time over time. Um, okay, um, I still don't, oh, sorry. Uh, okay, so I see Connie wanted to ask a question. I don't think I see any young people <laughs> asking questions, so I guess you, you can go ahead, Connie. Tend to be young, okay. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Diego. I had a question on the first part of your talk. Uh, on the on on these studies, you systematically only use the rotation period, and so surely loads of these stars also have other variability phenomena uh, that are perhaps related, but have 
perhaps not, but are more than the rotation period. And so for that, uh, surely the space uh, data and the ground data will make a difference in information. So I have two questions like, first of all, can't, can you exploit that? Did you try that? And mm -hmm. second, is there then a difference between your, your ground and your space uh, studies? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point, right? Because um, kind of to try to be inclusive in that sense, in this project, when we started the, the project, we decided to, again, to perform this blind search. Um, so if you go to my, my paper, we're actually providing the membership information for all the cluster stars that we found, regardless of whether they have measured rotation periods. Uh, yeah, and so, yeah, at some point we said, oh, you know, we should also use this to study, you know, we, we should cross match this with catalogs of X-ray emission or chromospheric emission and see, you know, what impact the membership cleanup makes um, on those projections. But uh, we just haven't had the time to explore that, but, you know, our, our, our data is public. And so anyone can really, do that experiment now. Um, so, but yeah, thank you for the for the um, suggestion. Um. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so then I guess uh, Joyce was asking a question, and then we go to Dan. Uh, so, Joyce, do you want to ask your question? Oh, okay, so yeah, I will ask it. So when do we expect Gaia DR3 or DR4 data and what will be, uh, will be improved that will enable further progress? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so I'll, I'll just show this figure to go along with the question. So for some clusters such as this one here, um, we couldn't run our analysis down here, uh, which you can kind of see here, right? Because uh, we stop having the ability to separate uh, or to classify stars as probable members in blue or non-members in red, but rather everything gets classified as a possible member where the answer is, you know, we don't know, there is no answer. And so we need better data to do that. Um, so I haven't run this with EDR3. I just been super busy <laughs> finishing my PhD. Um, so I suspect EDR3 will be super helpful, but I think eventually, you know, we definitely want to do this with DR4. Um, and my understanding is that the full DR3 is coming out uh, first half of next year, I believe. And then DR4, I don't, not, I don't know for sure, but probably a couple of years after that. Um, and so, yeah, that's definitely on the to-do list for the future, um, absolutely. Oh, okay, yeah, Connie, Connie is saying the spring 2022. Okay, uh, okay thanks. Um, okay, so Dan, uh, go ahead. Yes, thanks for a very nice talk, Diego, and congratulations on the successful defense. Uh, my question is related to what Joyce was asking with the uh, three. One of the things that Gaia will give us very soon in, in abundance is information about binaries, in particular once we actually get astrometry, a time result is geometry. Um, so I was wondering whether you can talk a little bit about how that will um, affect your future plans in, in studying these, uh, these clusters with, with Gaia data, because right now, presumably, mm -hmm. I mean, presumably from the spectra, you can, do, you can, you can get some information about, about these, um, but Gaia should help a lot. Uh, it does already, of course, with RUWE, but with the future data releases should get in even better. Exactly. I mean, yeah, so, so you have a great point, right? So even though our analysis was blind to ro rotation and preferential remove rotation outliers, some of them are still here. We suspect particularly these guys that I'm pointing out with my cursor that hopefully you can see um, yep. these guys down here. I suspect most of them are binaries. And I know for sure that some of them are binaries. I know that uh, Stephanie Douglas has done a ton of work kind of observing these guys. Um, but yeah, so I think, you know, I've been meaning to color code this by the Gaia renormal, renormalized unit weighted error um, because that would be super interesting. I would bet that at least half of these points will stick out as, you know, having high uh, Ruby in the sense that, you know, we, we use that as a uh, proxy for uh, binarity. Um, so definitely, you know, yeah, having better astrometry will be helpful, um, yeah. 
Um, and I guess the other thing that, I, you know, you talked about binaries and I didn't have to talk about white binaries in this talk. So I will, I'll, I'll, I will plug that here, which is that white binaries can provide very useful constraints for gyro chronology also at old ages. Um, and for that, you know, having very precise Gaia astrometry is also super helpful. Um, yep. Okay, great. Um, I don't know any, are there any other questions? Um, doesn't seem like it. Um, it's either people are tired or <laughs> it's late at night. Um, oh, Travis, uh, do you want to ask your, your question? Sure, uh, great job, Diego. Uh, I'm just wondering what improvements to either of these projects you might expect from data that comes from Plato. Oh, um, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I guess <laughs> uh, just looking a couple of steps into the future, I guess I'm, I'm excited to go towards uh, tests right now. I guess I haven't got it to the stage where I'm thinking about Plato that much. But of course, uh, the ultimate goal would be to, to um, increase our uh, samples with ro ro rotation periods. Um, so, um, yeah, sorry, I don't have a more uh, concrete answer to that. I'm very excited for Plato uh, right now. <laughs> okay, um, well, I guess we should have uh, some more additional long observations to allow us to get to some of these slow rotations as well. Um, Okay, um, so I don't see any other hands raised. Um, I don't know, Rita, do you think we should uh, call it off or? <laughs> well, I think it's uh, it's time to, to thank uh, Diego again for, for a very nice talk. Of course, Plato will, uh, will we expect to, to, to monitor uh, 250,000 stars, uh, like basic photometry at least. So you'll have a lot of, of data to play with. And, uh, and uh, in turn, Plato will expect some of uh, your work to help with uh, age determination for, for, uh, for a lot of the targets for which we will not have the, the exquisite uh, seismology that we will have for the prime sample. Um, so yeah, it's time to uh, to close the this seminar. Uh, thank you very much, Diego, for for a nice talk. Thank you everyone for uh, contributing to to this. And uh, so um, we'll have next time a talk for, given by Felix Alborn uh, from MPA Garching. Um, it will be about uh, uh, stellar convection, uh, turbulent convection theories uh, uh, for, I believe, intermediate mass stars. Um, and it will be in two weeks from now, uh, normal European 10 a.m. time. Um, thank you all for being with us. Uh, don't forget to go and have a look at our website and, and fetch the, the videos that you, of the talks you couldn't follow. Thanks a lot, everyone. Uh, and I can free everyone, even the steering committee from their duty <laughs> tonight. Thanks a lot. See you next time. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye.